All right. I <laughs> uh, appreciate very much the opportunity this evening to be your speaker, and uh, certainly hope that what I'll be able to uh, speak this, uh, this evening, this afternoon, whichever it is, this early evening, uh, will be beneficial to you. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit in Matthew 5, uh, which of course is the Sermon on the Mount, arguably probably one of the most popular sermons that Jesus gave. Um, undoubtedly, you've probably heard hundreds of lessons uh, on this subject. Uh, fun fact, um, in 2002, the, uh, the popular website BibleGateway.com uh, actually took a look at the top 10 cities um, that uh, internationally, uh, I should say as well, that represent the highest concentrations of web traffic that come through their website. Um, and they listed the top five chapters in each of those top 10 cities. And the Sermon on the Mount is in nine of those 10 international cities' top five chapters, um, the most notably being the Beatitudes in chapter five and the uh, Lord's Prayer in chapter six. We're not gonna be looking at either of those today though. We're gonna be looking at a couple of uh, uh, sets of verses sort of in the uh, first portion um, of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and we're going to take sort of a, uh, a close look at these. And they're well-known scriptures, but um, at least speaking for myself, these are ones that uh, I would read through and maybe not consider the full implications of. Um, and so hopefully I can sort of provide some additional context this evening uh, to these verses and uh, that might help elevate our understanding. So. Uh, Matthew 5 begins, of course, with Jesus <clears throat> uh, seeing the crowds retreating to a hill. His disciples follow him and sit down, and he begins to teach. And in verse 13, um, Jesus addresses them and declares, you are the salt of the earth. In chapter 5, verses 13, he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. I have the uh, New King James up there as well. It says that the salt loses its flavor. I don't have it up there, but you may have heard the NIV very often, which is that the salt loses its saltiness. Um, how can it be made salty again? Um, and just a, a quick note there, the, uh, uh, the become tasteless there, that's, it's, the way it's translated in all these, it's fine. Um, if you can use it any which way, that's not really the word in the Greek. It's really a, a, a uh, sort of an antonym of a word, in essence, uh, uh, to describe salt there. Uh, there's a, uh, it's used, or a similar word is used elsewhere in the scripture when talking about a com the comparisons between a wise becoming a fool, for example. Um, so it's just kind of a, a contrasting word. Anyway, um, so what I'd like to do for a moment here is <clears throat> sort of explore the significance um, of salt sort of throughout history. Um, and in, in this context, I think we can better understand this metaphor and its sort of relevance to us today. Because one of the things to keep in mind as we're kind of looking at really anything that Jesus taught, right? He used very um, practical um, metaphors uh, and examples and parables. These were things that his listeners would very easily understand. They were very simple to understand. And so when we take a look at these scriptures here, um, it can be a little bit confusing for us, but it was easily understood for them. So we want to kind of look back at how maybe they were looking at it and sort of their experiences so that we can better understand. Um, so throughout human history, um, salt is a, has been a very useful and precious commodity. Um, it, it carries both a variety of uses. It, it carries a lot of symbolism in a lot of different cultures. Um, in our modern day, we kind of look at salt as, as just being primarily a food seasoning, right? And certainly it was back then as well. Um, but, uh, you know, more than just something that augments and enhances the flavor of food, uh, in ancient times, specifically the time around when Jesus would be speaking, salt held great importance. Um, first and foremost, it was absolutely vital um, in the preservation of food, um, as obviously there was no refrigeration or anything like that, um, and wouldn't be for, for many centuries later. Um, it was even used uh, as, as a, commonly as a form of trade, as sort of a currency, I guess, if you will, um, and also a part of very many uh, religious um, rituals. So its value um, was so great, in fact, that uh, it's believed that Roman soldiers received a salary that included uh, an allowance for salt. 
um, which many scholars believe gave rise to the phrase worth their weight in salt, which we later anglicized into worth is salt. Um, and uh, in fact, the word salary actually comes from the Latin word salarium, which they believe is what this allowance was actually called. Um, so um, as we kind of mentioned, you know, it was used in preservation and by dehydrating, killing bacteria, preventing de uh, decay, inhibiting enzymes. Um, and in an era before refrigeration, this was really the first and only effective method of food preservation. Um, salt is, is used, at least in, in a little bit of salt anyway, it can be used as a fertilizer. Although a large quantity will, you know, lay waste to an area as well. Um, in fact, this power to sort of purge impurity and even destroy is used in scripture in a few places in the Old Testament. And we'll kind of look at a few of these here. Deuteronomy, it says the whole land will be burning waste of salt and sulfur, nothing planted, nothing sprouted, no vegetation growing on it. Uh, Abimelech, it says he pressed the attack against the city until he had captured and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. Jeremiah 48 verses nine says, put salt on Moab for she will be laid waste. Her towns will become desolate uh, and no one to live in them. <clears throat> Certainly a different, uh, uh, not different idea when we think of salt. Um, salt roads, um, that's something, if you read throughout, especially the, the history of uh, um, sort of the Mediterranean uh, and, and uh, Middle Eastern area, salt roads spanned all throughout uh, the Mediterranean, and those were major trade routes um, that spurred the growth of a lot of economies and, uh, and were primary transportations for salt. Um, it was used in medicine to treat wounds and digestive issues. It was used in uh, the Roman and Greek baths. Um, in ancient Egypt, it was used in purification rituals and mummification and uh, sacrifices to gods. Even for the Israelites, it was symbolic. symbolic. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, it says that every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God will not be lacking from your grain offering. Numbers 18, verses 19 says, Whatever you set aside from your holy offerings and to the, uh, the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you, to your sons and daughters, as your perpetual share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord, both you and your offspring. Second Kings, verses 221 says, Then he went out to the spring and he threw salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. Salt was highly valuable uh, I mean, exceedingly useful. And... It's within this rich historical context that Jesus chooses to use the comparison of his disciples to salt. And given this context, what he's really saying about his disciples, and by extension, you know, sort of, well, I guess let's back up and talk about really how do we apply this to us today, right? How do we apply this to ourselves? Um, and this is, this is where I think, you know, a lot of people kind of go into this this topic and these set of verses, and this is kind of what they focus on. And certainly, we're going to you know kind of like to talk about this a little bit. But there's another aspect of this this scripture that we want to talk about. So, just as salt is valuable uh, and useful for many aspects of life, so we are as the children of His kingdom as well. Um, just as salt enhances uh, flavor, we enhance the lives in the world around us through hope, joy, kindness, and encouragement. Um, just as salt preserves, so we are to be the preserving agents of love, mercy, and peace. And just as salt purifies and cleanses, so we are to be the living examples of purity, righteousness, patience, and self-control. Um, we're to add to this world and not subtract from it. We're to provide valuable uh, value and usefulness, building up the others up and bringing them closer to God through our actions, through our attitudes, and spreading the word, uh, of the, or the, spreading the gospel. And we'll say more on this uh, a little bit later, but we'll kind of we'll kind of move on as I'm quickly running out of time. Which <laughs> I tried to make this, by the way, a lot shorter than my last one since I took so long on my last lesson. So <laughs> I'm trying to get through this. I'll hopefully not keep you guys. Um, so going back uh, to to Matthew chapter five, uh, verse thirteen, the analogy that Jesus uses there does not stop. Right? On the contrary, it serves really as a consequence of failing to live up to our responsibility as well, where it says, if the salt become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. Now, this is something that, you know, on a base level, I think is simple enough to understand, right? Um, but I've always looked at this scripture and kind of wondered, why is it worded this way? Uh, what is it really talking about? Because 
obviously from our standpoint, what we actually have today is very pure, right? Uh, you go pull your salt from any, any cabinet or any source and it's perfectly sodium chloride crystals. They're all the exact same size, right? And it's highly processed and everything. And that's exactly what you get and that's it. Obviously that's not what it was available to them back then. Um, and so from a scientific standpoint, how can salt become not salty? It can't, it's either sodium chloride or it's not. It's something completely different. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's entirely stable. It doesn't degrade. It doesn't lose its properties. Um, salt is salt, right? Um, it can't become unsalty without something becoming something else entirely. So at least from our understanding, um, this is, you know, what we think about because it's what we have in our pantries at home. And it's, it's largely, you know, like I said, through processing and refinement, uh, made pure. Um, however, um, we have a tendency, I think, to, at least for me, I, I tended to think of this metaphor as more just an absurdity, like it's meant to be kind of an absurdity. Uh, that salt, of course, can't become saltless, you know, uh, or lose its saltiness. Um, and that's the point, right? That uh, when you become a Christian, you're to have certain qualities and properties, like the saltiness and salt, and a Christian can't lack those qualities as a Christian, just like salt can't lack saltiness. And I don't think that's an entirely wrong, uh, you know, assessment of the scripture, but I think it misses the point of the metaphor and the practicality of the metaphor. Um, so as, uh, like I said, as Jesus's metaphors often were uh, very practical, I think this one is as well. And so and we have to understand salt in the context of, of this time period in which Jesus is speaking. So we use a lot of methods these days to extract salt, um, you know, usually through evaporation pools and, and various refinement methods. Back then, that's they didn't have any of that. In fact, they didn't even have any of the drilling and stuff. We get a lot of ours from underground. That was that did not exist back then. Um, that was actually a product of the 19th century. So that's a very recent thing of us drilling underground uh, to extract salt. So they they largely got theirs from open veins, places like the Valley of Salt, just uh, south of the Dead Sea. That was where a lot actually, and where a lot of the salt roads ran through. Um, you know, that's where a lot of it was pooled. And I won't get into the scientific portions of bituminous salt and, you know, uh, the fact that a large, of it, large amount of it was magnesium chloride and not sodium chloride and so on. We're, it's really not important. Um, but what is, I think, important is understanding that it was not pure in the sense that we think of it today. Um, it was largely rock salt um, that contained a lot of other minerals, a lot of heavy metals and other impurities. Um, and these slabs is really what they do is they carve out these slabs and then they would crush and ground these, you know, into chunks or just into fine powders for use. Um, the more obviously minerals that these things contained, the less salty they were naturally because there's less sodium chloride it, it contained within it. Um, additionally, salt is also a lighter mineral. A lot of these other minerals that were contained were very heavy. Um, like I said a lot of the metals were very heavy as well. So whenever you're taking a powderized form of this salt and everything and you exposed it to the elements or even the slabs themselves, the top portions of that slab largely were not salty, even though they looked like salt, because a lot of the salt would get blown through the wind uh, and degraded or it would get uh, uh, dissolved by the rain um, and run off. And so you had to chip through that stuff to get to the inner portions of these slabs in order to obtain the actual salt, saltiness of the salt. Um, additionally, when you have a powderized form of it, again, the salt is gonna blow away in the wind before any of the other minerals do. Um, and then, you know, moisture, rain, and things like that is gonna dissolve it as well. And uh, um, even, even the matter of, of just simply shaking up uh, these things would allow some of these minerals to sort of settle uh, as well and separate. Um, again, a lot of it looked just like salt, though, because it was all very dirty. <laughs> and so it all kind of looked the same. It appeared to be salt, but there was a large portion of it that was not salty, um, as it contained no sodium chloride or, or had very little saltiness within it. Um, so the whole point is that you improperly stored this or left it out to the elements, um, that it would, in fact, lose virtually all its saltiness. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they would, like I said, scrape or chip away these top layers and everything else to uh, get to the salty interior. Um, the issue is that you couldn't use this saltless salt for anything. It had no use whatsoever. It couldn't be thrown out um, into the garden areas or into any kind of green areas because it would toxify the soil and kill everything off. 
So you couldn't do anything with it, but throw it out in the street. Uh, you certainly weren't going to take a trip, you know, a few miles down the road just to dump your salt, you know. As with anything else that was a, a product of just simply trash uh, like that, it was thrown out in the streets. Um, consequently, it kind of worked out well in their favor because then it killed anything that might grow up through the cracks in the streets and stuff as well and then clear the streets off and everything else. It kind of worked in their favor in that sense. But nevertheless, um, they couldn't do anything with it. It had no use. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't healthy to obviously consume, um, and it couldn't be thrown out any other way. So it just simply had to be thrown into the streets. Um, so understanding this, um, at least I gained a little bit different perspective of this metaphor. Salt has many different uses, but if left to the world, unused, um, the beneficial salt is stripped away, and all you're left with are the impurities, which are no longer good for anything. Of course, like I said, you don't need to understand the science uh, to understand this metaphor. This was something, like I said, this was very practical. And they understood that there were portions of the salt that became saltless or lost their saltiness over time and were no longer useful. So this is really a metaphor that serves as a warning, I think, to Christians to not become complacent or to lose sight of our purpose, that we must be vigilant in preserving our faith and our integrity and our commitment to Christ, so that we don't lose our effectiveness as ambassadors to his kingdom. Because if we don't, the end result is that we'll simply be thrown out and trampled underfoot, um, which is not uh, not a pleasant image. Um, so now that we understand this, let's move on to the next verse that gives us another metaphor. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify Father, our Father, excuse me, your Father who is in heaven. This is a fairly, I think, straightforward set of scriptures. Um, I think we all understand light is a symbol, right? Um, it's been used consistently throughout literature um, in uh all across all cultures, across all time, um, as a symbol for good and righteousness. It's used throughout the scriptures as a symbol to represent godliness and good. Um, so I think it's, very, it's something we're very, very familiar with, right? Um, we understand that light, uh, a light that's covered um, and, and hidden away does no good. But what I want to take a look at with the scripture is not just the concept of light as representing righteousness or good. Um, I specifically want to look at how this coincides with something that Jesus says just a few verses later in chapter 6. It says, Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Sounds a little bit contradictory, right? Let's keep going. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they will be praised by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that the charitable giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees it, what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they will be seen by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. <clears throat> it clearly states that things, to do things in secret, right? Which seems a little paradoxical to the concept in chapter 5 that clearly says to let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good works, right? So how do we reconcile these two concepts? Because they seem contradictory and, in fact, have often been said to be contradictory uh, by atheists and, and people who don't believe. So we want to talk about why they're not only not contradictory, but they're, in fact, very complementary to each other. And that is because it comes down to this. There is a difference between being a beacon of light and shining a spotlight on yourself. Um, from a distance, these look like the same thing. Um, but there's a very big difference to what these two things are. And it really comes down to a matter of the heart. 
um, right, our motive. Um, again, we're going to talk about why these two verses are not only not contradictory, but they harmonize quite well. Um, <clears throat> we choose to do good, to please our Heavenly Father, right, to make him proud. Pure light comes from God, and our character should be a reflection of his character, right? We forgive because God forgave us, right? We're faithful because he was faithful. Um, we allow our light um, to shine, or I should say not our light, we allow the light of Christ, really, to shine and illuminate our actions while our focus remains on pleasing God rather than seeking approval and praise from others. Our authenticity should therefore draw the attention to the end glory, not to ourselves, but to the source of our light. In fact, uh, this morning, uh, my father, you know, one of the things that he mentioned is that one of the pillars of Christianity is what? Removing self, right? Denying self. That's what it ends up coming being about, right? And that perfectly kind of coincides with this concept of what we're talking about as well, is we're, we're doing this not for ourselves, not to shine light on ourselves, but to glorify God. John chapter 8, separate these out, we'll just go through them. John chapter 8, verses 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to, again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, it says, A man came, one sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. <clears throat> but he came to testify about the light. This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into uh, being through him, and yet the world did not know him. Colossians 3, verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So other than motive, why does it matter, Right? Especially from an atheistic point of view, some would argue that motive really doesn't matter when it comes to doing good, right? As long as other people benefit from the good deed, right, what does it matter? Um, and, you know, when thinking about that, is the value of the good deeds provided lessened? Well, and probably not. Um, the, uh, losing my place here. It really depends on the case. Um, but I think most of the time, I'd say probably not, uh, if that's the only metric that you really consider. Um, but if the benefit of the deed to the, to the recipient is affected very little at most, then the difference would be the benefit to the giver, right? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I have not love, I gain nothing. So with that, let's take a look back at the examples in Matthew 6. I don't know if I, I do have this. Okay, good. And its explanation, because it really it explains everything right there in chapter 6 as well, right? It says, what? Truly I say to you, they have received their reward in full because they've been praised by people, right? That's the reward that they give, that they, they get as a result of their pride um, and selfishness. <clears throat> So if you choose, or the reason it profits nothing, right, and the reason the scriptures say that it profits nothing is because there is no lasting spiritual value. Um, if you choose to receive your reward here on earth, that's fine, but then you forfeit your reward in heaven. Uh, what you receive here is temporary, right? As my father explained this morning, it's fleeting, right? It's gone tomorrow. It loses its value. Um, it will never have lasting value, even on this earth. So certainly in the context of spiritual eternity, it has zero value whatsoever. Um, 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 4, verses 5 says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness 
and disclose the motives of human hearts, and then praise will come to each person from God. <clears throat> if we are to be the light of the world, and we are to live as lights, um, then what we do will be seen, um, period. By nature, it can't be hidden. It will be noticed. Even the smallest amount of light in total darkness can be seen. So what it comes down to is that our life should be sincere, and it should be authentic, and it should be a beacon of Christ to the world, shining wherever we go so that others are blessed by it, so that their world around them is illuminated, so that they uh, what is hidden was brought to light, so that the paths set before them can be seen. They can see where their paths lead, and they can see where ours lead as well. <clears throat> John 3 Verses 20 through 21 says, For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices truth comes to the light, so his deeds may be revealed as, they've been, as having been performed in God. <clears throat> so the passages from Matthew 5 and 6 um, I submit to you are not paradoxical, but rather complement each other beautifully, emphasizing both the importance of being uh, a light to the world, being the salt of the earth, and the uh, necessity of, of authentic motives in our acts of righteousness, and the importance of being useful and active in our good deeds and in our acts of righteousness, so that we do not become complacent and therefore become useless um, spiritually to the kingdom. As Christians, let us cultivate a heart-centered faith that seeks God's approval above all else, ensuring that our righteousness is insincere and untainted by pride or hypocrisy. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, and then we'll close. It says, For God, who said, the, uh, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give, us, or to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. <clears throat> Uh, that concludes my remarks this evening. I finished just two and a half minutes from <laughs> Terry. Uh, I appreciate your attention this very much. Certainly, we don't want to end without uh, extending the invitation. Um, if you are a Christian um, and uh, you feel like you've sinned uh, in, in a public manner and need the, the prayers of the church, certainly you can come forward. If you're not, um, now is the time, right? Uh, the, as we said, the, uh, our light is not of ourselves. It comes from Christ. Um, and uh, uh, as children of his kingdom, we have responsibilities. Um, it is not something, as, as was explained this morning, that we simply have and that we do not work for. We have things that we need to do. Um, we believe uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We confess our sins. We repent uh, or, or confess uh, his name before men. And we are baptized and buried with him in baptism and raised a new person. If you have not uh, followed these steps, you can uh, come forward at this time as we still listen. My God has said his light will shine, his light will shine in the hearts of men. The rivers need a dark.